So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys? And welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Katani. Today, I am joined by Tosin Odawule. Tosin was born and raised in the Midwest to parents who quickly amassed a real estate portfolio of 200 units before they were 26 years old. Often, Tosin would accompany his mother to supervise the properties as, as a small portion of them were self-managed. It was here he was introduced to earning income through semi-passive cash flowing assets instead of physical labor. Today, Tosin is the founder of Building Acquisition Partners United, a Regulation D 506C fund that has a focus on Midwest apartment complexes. He's an author of Focus on the Fix, a book crafted from a 2018 TED Talk he gave of the same name aimed at always looking for solutions in the time of tribulation. Tosin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So typically how I start with my guests is, you know, their journey from W2 or how they discovered commercial real estate, but you were introduced at a very young age. So kind of talk about that. And, and did you jump right into it as well uh, as soon as uh, your career started? Well, yeah, and yeah, no. So I didn't jump right into it. Um, as far back as I can remember, uh, my parents always owned re real estate. And so um, my mother, who kind of used to double as like the property manager for some of the smaller assets, she would take me with her sometimes to like cut grass or pick up rent checks or, you know, there was a couple of times we went to evict some tenants before. So I was kind of always around it. Um, it wasn't really something that I wanted to get into until a lot later, probably my early 20s. Um, my dad, even though he was a real estate investor, he was always in the IT field. So at that time, I wanted to be what my dad was, which at that time was kind of like a computer programmer. So as a kid, you know, I wanted, I wanted to do, you know, computer programming and, and be in the IT field. It wasn't until later, probably when I was about 15 years old, uh, my dad had sent me overseas to a boarding school. Uh, first, it was in England. And then middle of 2000, he sent me to Nigeria, to Africa, where I finished uh, boarding school. So when I was in Nigeria, that's really when I kind of, kind of grew into wanting to be an entrepreneur. Um, my senior year of high school, um, I took uh, the SATs. And I didn't do too well. I think I got like a 1080 or something like that. But um. A couple months later in school, I got called into the principal's office and they told me that I got accepted into college in the United States. I didn't know how that was possible because I didn't apply to any colleges at all. And I still had like a whole semester left of my senior year. So I wasn't even sure how that was possible. I didn't know if maybe my dad did it or my mom or something like that. So I just had the bright idea. I said, hey, I'm already accepted in, into college already. So I'm not going to class anymore. <laughs> You know, so I spent the last half of the semester just in the dorm and I started reading a lot of books. And so that was when I first caught wind of the, you know, the famed rich dad, poor dad book that everybody talks about. And yeah, this was like year, this is 2005. And so I just went through that entire series. So it must've been like five or six books. And I just read them, you know, back to back, back to back. And so that was when I was kind of like, you know what? My parents are in real estate. Maybe when I get back, this will be something that I'll kind of take seriously. Um, didn't necessarily do that. When I came back, I wanted to be a college kid, you know, freshman year of college. I wanted to have that experience. You know, I, I didn't spend my teens in the States. So I kind of wanted to just feel what, what it was like to be in America and, you know, be free again and stuff like that. Uh, probably when I was 23, no, 22, uh, my mom owned a nursing home for mentally challenged adults. And so she brought me on to be assistant manager and help her manage that business with employees and clients, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when she started buying real estate in front of me. And, you know, we drive by houses and she'll say, hey, that one's up for tax auction. I'm gonna go to the auction, I'm gonna bid on that. And when she started buying those properties from the tax auction, that's when I really started saying, okay, mom, how do you do this? You know, she was buying properties that were, you know, $10,000, $12,000 because of tax liens. 
and she put maybe 5,000 into them, paint, landscaping, and then rent them out to Section 8 tenants. And so that was when I kind of said, hey, Ma, I, I want to see like how you're doing this, because to buy a house for $12,000 is unheard of. I, I didn't even know what tax auctions or tax liens or any of that stuff was. So that's when I kind of started kind of looking into what she was doing. And then it, was, it wasn't until 2015 that I bought my first property, which I bought from the city of Newark. Uh, that was basically, it was something to where all the properties in the city that they had foreclosed from people that hadn't paid property taxes or that were abandoned. Typically city halls, they're not in the real estate business. They don't wanna manage a huge portfolio of properties. So they sold them for thousand dollars each. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so I had, to, I had to get there like six in the morning. I waited probably about seven or eight hours. It was really, really cold. And I got one of the last properties that they were auctioning off, spent a thousand dollars for it. And that was my first property. Now, uh, prior to that, I had done wholesaling here and there, wasn't really successful at it according to what I deemed to be success. And I was making $1,000 a deal, $2,000 a deal. But um, buying property and becoming an owner, that's when I kind of realized that you kind of have more of the leverage. Uh, I ended up selling that property as is, did nothing to it, sold it for $75,000. And literally wow. the only thing I did <laughs> the entire time that I owned that property was I cut the grass a few times uh, just so I wouldn't get fined. Um, just very minimal stuff, paid the property taxes, which were next to nothing because the city had gave me a tax abatement, which covered, I believe, probably about 80% of the property taxes for five years. And then I sold it and then used that to start getting into other property, bought a 22 unit in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, the first fund that I was a part of, uh, Tulsa Real Estate Fund, we launched in 2018. Uh, we bought 98 units, apartment complex in Macon, Georgia through that fund. And so that's kind of when I started to just be more active and just wanted to get into commercial assets, apartment buildings, things of that nature. And was, was that a single asset fund? So it was just that 98 unit? No, it wasn't a single asset. Uh, there was a lot of properties we actually bought through that fund. That, that was a regulation A tier two fund. And so uh, I wanted to get into larger assets and I wanted to focus on the Midwest. You know, so I decided to just resign as vice president from there and, and start my own fund and focus on the Midwest. And so I did that in 2019, about a year into operation. I believe through that fund, we acquired roughly about 12 properties. It's still going on now. They're still buying up stuff around the country. So we were talking offline. You love the Midwest. Specifically, we were talking how you're in basically Chicago proper. Obviously, like we mentioned, not a very popular market for your average real estate investor. So kind of talk about that. And, and you mentioned you love it and, you know, talk about the challenges and how you overcome them and, and you know, what that market's like. So, the, you know, the challenges I would probably say starts from like a lending standpoint, because as you said, a lot of people don't really like Chicago. So a lot of lenders typically try to stay away from there, especially for like commercial stuff, unless it's a hard money lender. Um, the reason why I like the Chicago market um, I'll use this as an analogy. In California, to buy a single family home, even in the worst neighborhood of LA, or the, you're looking at 600, 700, 800,000. And this is probably going to be a property that needs a ton of work. Um, currently, I'm closing on a six unit, April 15th in Chicago, fully turnkey, cash flowing tenants for $235,000. Wow. And I, I have a $25,000 roof that I have to repair. So okay. when you look at Chicago or Cook County or, you know, the, the suburbs of Chicago, you can find properties that are cash flowing turnkey, but the acquisition costs are very, very low. So your cap rates are higher, you know, so I'm, I'm putting roughly about 40,000 down um, on this six unit that's kicking out already about 5,500 a month. And so those types of deals in the Chicago uh, South Side and submarkets are pretty common. You know, it's not like in Atlanta or in LA to where to find an eight cap property, you're in good luck. You know, in, in Chicago, you can find 12, 13, 14, 15 regularly, you know, and, and the cost of rent is going up in Chicago. They call Chicago the New York of the Midwest. So um, when people leave towns like St. Louis, Missouri, or they leave Champaign, Illinois, or all these little small college towns or country towns that are in that area. If they're not going to California, New York, Atlanta, Miami, they're going to Chicago. You know, so the population in Chicago is somewhat growing. Uh, there's a lot of 
companies and, and schools that are in Chicago. CBS is headquartered there. Uh, you have Northwestern Law School, which is one of the top law schools in the country is there. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of industry that's there, which still makes it attractive for people to move to Chicago, but yet the cost of acquisition is still relatively low. And I, I think it'll stay that way for at least another three, four years. And are you syndicating these deals or are you able to finance them through JVs or what, how are you typically structuring these? It's a case by case. So anything that's done through the, the Reg D fund is basically a syndication. Um, the sixth unit that I'm closing on, I do have a partner, my partner, Will Palmer, who's out of Atlanta, Georgia. We're going half on that. Uh, so typically it's, it's going to be JV or syndication, just depending on the property, how much cash I have or don't have on hand. So that kind of just changes depending on the situation. And are these all part of the same fund? So you're, you're putting all these assets into one fund? Correct. Yeah. They all, okay. as far as my interest on the JVs that I do, I always come in as GP on the fund. Got it. Okay. And how have you, I know one thing that's big is obviously when you're doing this is, is the team and, and the people you put around you. So how, how are you building that team and vetting your partners and, and finding the people you want to work with? That also is like a case by case type of deal. Um, when it came to Chicago, since I don't live there anymore, I, I needed eyes on the ground that could deal source for me, that could send referrals for inspectors, attorneys, things of that nature. So I reached out to a lot of my old college buddies. You know, I did go to college in Illinois uh, freshman, freshman year before I transferred to the East Coast. And I found out that um, two of my frat brothers, uh, they go by the Downing Brothers. And they are firefighters by day, home flippers by night. You know, they had an HGTV pilot. They currently have a show on True TV right now. It's called Backyard Bar Wars. Okay. And so it's just basically a show where they compete against each other, building the best backyard for somebody. And so they handle a lot of my property management in Chicago. They're born and raised from, from Chicago. Uh, they've done a lot of deals with the city, with investors. And they really just know the market like the back of their hand. So that was number one, getting in touch with them and kind of just figuring out how we were gonna work that out. Uh, when it came to brokers to find me off market deals, you know, somebody who's in that Chicago market, they can, you know, they'll have deals come across their desk every day. They can vet them before they even send them over to me. Um, and then also just targeting what part of the city I wanna focus on. And so that was when I kind of found out, okay, Riverdale, the South Shore, those are the South side sub markets that make sense for me outside of like downtown or the north side or Lakeview where my uncles lived for like 40 years to where, you know, a duplex up there is 900,000, <laughs> you know? So wow. just to kind of identify where in this city I want to deploy the capital, that's kind of where I just kind of leaned on the people that were there. It took me about two or three years to kind of build those relationships to where they, you know. And sense. is this low income housing or is this just regular, you know, suburban, it depends. So when it comes to Chicago suburbs, some of those suburbs are low income housing and some of them are just suburbs that are just very sleepy, you know, but they're just not, they're not really opportunity zones. Uh, Riverdale, where we're purchasing the six unit could be considered low income housing or opportunity zones, depending where in that neighborhood, uh, where I'm at, not so much. Um, so that also is kind of like, it's, it, the one thing I learned is that it's never a one size fits all thing. Chicago is very much a block city. Each block, things are different. Things can change. And so that's kind of where you need, you know, eyes on the ground to where you can kind of pivot where you need to instead of going in blind. Okay, that makes total sense. So really it's about, obviously you created a team that you can now rely on to, you know, once you identify a property, look at a property, you've got the broker relationship. So you really established you know, yourself in that area. And it sounds like you're willing to take on whatever kind of deal comes your way. Anything that that's cash flowing. I mean, what I, what I realized with the acquisitions we did with our first fund is that if something's cash flowing, you have a property manager in place, you have that system being able to run without you being there. Once you kind of master that, you can pretty much go anywhere in the country. You know, there was um, a gentleman who was kind of, I wouldn't say he was a mentor, but he kind of, you know, gave me mentor-ish uh, vibes, uh, a gentleman named Chris Urso out of New York. And he told me many years ago, he said, um, live where you want to, invest where it makes sense. And so he only purchases, I believe in the Carolinas, but he lives in Long Island. 
And he says he'll never, ever buy anything in Long Island. But when it comes to the Carolinas, he'll snatch up 240 unit complexes, 300 unit complexes, et cetera. So I kind of just tried to take that, that advice and run with that. Okay, that makes total sense. So is that kind of your ultimate goal? Is this kind of building that infrastructure to eventually get into those larger assets? Or do you like staying in this smaller asset class? Um, the smaller asset class is easier to get in, especially when you're, you know, only on your second fund. You know, I'm still building my relationships with accredited investors. So a lot of the money I use is out of my own pocket. So it's easier to get into the smaller deals first. Um, I, I like to amass, you know, two to 300 units solo by myself before I start looking at the 150 unit properties. Cause you know, that 20% on a $15 million deal is way more than 20% on 235,000. Yes. That's, yeah. 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 That math checks out for sure. <laughs> yeah. So it's just kind of a, just about being patient and just growing at the pace that is healthy for me to grow. So that's kind okay. of, I love that. That's awesome. So it sounds like you've kind of got that down. So let's kind of pivot here a little bit. You gave a Ted talk in 2018, wrote a book about it. So kind of talk about that, where, what, how that came about and, and, you know, the book and what's that, what that's done for you. Well, yeah, I mean, that book was really kind of, it was kind of birthed from just uh, uh, my life experiences. You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was sent to a boarding school when I was 14 years old in a country I had never been in before. My dad took me there, left me there, took me to school, got my uniform, showed me to my dorm room, and then he left. So I was pretty much on my own from 14 on. And so a lot of the things that I had to deal with, not being around my friends, not being around my family, I have five brothers, you know, I, I didn't see them for five and a half years. Um, you kind of have to learn how to keep your mental in check, especially during a time when, you know, you're going through puberty and there's all these things that are kind of changing. And so that's just something that I just learned that there's always going to be trials and tribulations that come. There's always going to be things that knock you off your pivot or mess up your day. So we can focus on the problem and how much it hurts and how painful it is, or we can just try to say, okay, we have a problem. What is the solution for it? And just try to focus on that as quickly as we can so that we can get out of whatever feeling or whatever, you know, it's kind of bringing us down. And so I, I had to deal with that in several times, jumping from school to school, you know, um, you know um, missing friends, missing family, um, uh, having to adapt to new environments every year, every year and a half. And so when I got older, when I came back to the States when I was 20, I kind of, you know, without even knowing it, kind of just employed that in everything I do in my life. Anytime something happens to me that I don't like, I immediately get into that problem solving mode and try to figure out, okay, how do I fix this? How do I fix this? And I, I think it's helped me a lot. And so um, when the TED Talk opportunity came, came about, I said, hey, let me actually formulate this and, and talk about it. <laughs> you know, maybe other people can, can learn from it or it can help other people. And then did that TED Talk in 2018 and then began writing a book to it, which I, I think I published that in 2021, first quarter of 2021. Awesome. That's so awesome. Anytime you, you become a published author, that just sets you into another echelon of category, right? So from that, has that helped you kind of build your, your network and, and find investors and, and start to, you know, work, work in that favor as well? Or has that kind of been separate? Well, yeah, I think because, you know, that book is not necessarily a business book per se. It's more of like a, uh, a book, book on life. But um, it did kind of add on top of all the things I've been doing for years, just kind of make myself more attractive for people to listen to my pitches. Uh, one of the reasons why I did the TED Talk, TED is, a, is an established platform. Typically, when you're on TED, people listen to you a bit more. Um, but, you know, I had spent many years, probably since 2011, just utilizing social media, going to meetups. Um, when I was wholesaling, I would always record all of my walkthroughs. I would always put that online so that people could see I'm in the industry. Even if I'm not getting a deal done, I'm putting time, I'm putting in my 10,000 hours to learn. And so that was kind of how I met my first initial investors. Um, and then just really just building relationships from there. Uh, really just being seen, you know, doing podcasts like 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 yours, it, it may expose me to 
two or three people that had never heard of me before. And now down the line, they're a potential investor. So that has always been what I've kind of used to kind of get money where I need to get it from to get into a deal, <laughs> you know? And Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really awesome. And, and like you said, it's, it's more life focused, but really what it comes down to is like you said, content is king, right? So anytime your name is written down, that's just building your credibility, whether it's a life book, a business book, whatever it is, right. people are going to see that. And that's just going to solidify, you know, their trust in you. And obviously no like, and trust when it comes to raising capital, that's, that's how it is. So from that, you know, you've obviously started to amass this, this nice portfolio. Are you nomadic? Do you run things pretty remotely or are you pretty, we meant, you mentioned offline, you're living in Atlanta. Is that like your permanent home? Well, yeah, I'm between Miami and Atlanta. Um, I do have, I have an exotic car rental business in Miami. So oh, wow. I, I am there pretty regularly. Um, I like to probably move down to Florida uh, um, permanently at some point in time, maybe the next year or so. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm nomadic to the point to where I will look at deals and, you know, initially vet them online. But if something really piques my interest, I just book a flight and go out there. So, you know, I, I still kind of feel that I have to put my hands on it. I have to really just see it. You know, pictures and video is not enough for me, especially if I'm thinking of committing, you know, a few hundred grand into a deal. But um, yeah, I'll do the initial vetting online. I'll see if I can get any cash flow statements, any T12s, all that stuff. And if things look good on paper, I book a flight, I go out there and try to, you know, put my eyes on it, talk to tenants, walk through each unit, stuff like that. Nice. So do you do all your own underwriting then as well? Yes. Uh, I like to kind of position out of that, you know, um, underwriting for me, I think deal sourcing is more of, of, of my skill and my forte underwriting. Oh my God. Sometimes looking at those Excel sheets, it's, 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 it's harder, you know? So I've, I've, there's been many times where I've paid underwriters, you know, per deal, underwrite this deal for me. I'd be a thousand bucks, things of that nature. But, um, you know, I, I'd like to not have to do that <laughs> on my own. So if I could hire somebody full time for that, that'd be great. I think it'd allow me to move a lot faster. Totally. I mean, you're preaching the choir. It is not my strong suit. Even as someone who comes from a finance background, I, I, I so I have so much respect for people who can just sit and just yeah. underwrite. And especially in today's market, as I'm sure you know, and maybe not so much Chicago, but you're underwriting like a hundred deals before you're even making an offer. And to me, that is just, yeah. So yeah. is it kind of similar in that market, even though there's not as much competition or... Um, on the smaller deals, it's not as difficult because, I mean, if I'm looking at income ex and expense of a, of a six unit, what's the current mortgage, what's the property taxes, common area expenses, and it's something that I, I can do on my own. Now, if I'm looking at a portfolio of, you know, maybe it's 80 units over five properties and they're in different counties, different property taxes, different water bills, maybe some have liens on them. then that's 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 not something that I'm going to just totally take a look at myself. I'm going to pass that around a couple of times just to make sure my numbers are right. Totally. That makes perfect sense. So all this being said, what what are your goals moving forward and what is what does the future look like? Um, I mean. The fund, it's currently I have a one hundred million dollar max offering for my reg D. So in the next year and a half to two years, I'd like to wrap that up um, and then just really go gung ho in Chicago South Side. And then, you know, I'd kind of want to take some time off for the next couple of years and, you know, have some kids, raise a family. And, you know, it, it's, it's really more of just setting up the assets that will carry on my life and my family for how, however, however long, <laughs> you know, we're, we're blessed to be on this earth. Um, my mother is retiring in a year or so. We just finished building her retirement home in Nigeria. So she's actually there right now. I think she comes back in like two weeks. So just being able to make sure that she will be set when she's over there so that, you know, if there's anything she needs, it's just a wire, you know, um, that that's kind of the reason, the strategy behind building up the different assets now, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. That's so awesome. And so important, obviously, to have those goals. And and of course, you know, when you can set up your family, that's one thing for me too, is, you know, my dad's an old farm boy and didn't really set himself up for retirement. So part of me is like wanting, you know, help out the family and make sure, you know, he doesn't have to work forever. So I love that a lot. 
Awesome. Well, we're getting towards the end here. So I have uh, five questions that I ask all of my guests, the final five questions. So we'll jump into those. First question is uh, best advice you've gotten from a mentor. Best advice I've gotten from a mentor. I would probably say very, very important to ask questions that you know you don't know instead of faking like you know it. A lot of times in real estate, I actually just went through this. Uh, I was looking at a deal that uh, was sent to me from some wholesalers and they didn't know how to underwrite the deal. They didn't have a contract to even assign to me. I don't even think that they were even in touch with the actual owner of the portfolio. It was for 172 single family homes in North Carolina. And so instead of them saying, hey, we don't know if we're actually talking to the seller, they were trying to finesse it and say, hey, we'll find this out. And then, you know, when we got a conference call and everybody's on the phone and all of them said, hey, no, I'm not the owner. We're not the owner. We're talking to this guy, that guy, that guy. And so I think, um, you know, in any pr professional industry, it's okay to just say you don't know something and then go and ask somebody who does. Because once you know, you, you no longer have to fake anymore because you know. You know, so that has really, really helped me. There's a lot of things that, you know, sometimes you're embarrassed to not know about. And it's like, hey, just ask. Now you know. It's so yeah. true. And, and once you realize, like, once you get over that hump of realizing and actually admitting you don't know is makes you look so much better and, and more intelligent than trying to pretend. It's, it's such a game changer because then all of a sudden people have so much respect for you because then you just say, you know what, I don't know, but I'm going to go get the answer. Correct. 100%. Awesome. Second question. What is it about your career, what you're doing that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Oh my God. It is. Um, it's, it's always new experiences. Every deal you get into, every market you go to, every city you visit, it's always something new. It doesn't feel mundane or redundant at all. Um, you're dealing with different characters, depending on who owns the property. And I just like that, you know, I, I try, I, I kind of tried to liken it to, you know, if you're painting, like a painter has a canvas, depending on what they decide to put on there based on, on the paint, it could be anything. And so that's how I feel real estate is, is that it's just always new. It's not like a nine to five when you go in and you have the same job from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's like things change cities change, environments change, markets change. So it's always new. It never really gets old. So that's why it just stays exciting. Awesome. I love that so much. What a great answer. What is your favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Oh, um, The Corner Office by Adam Bryant. Love it. Okay. Uh, I don't think I've heard of that one. It's a, it's a great book. I think it was published in 2010. Um, okay. Adam Bryant used to be a journalist at the New York Times, I believe. And this particular book is about like grooming, like um, company culture. And so it, it's, it's kind of based around building company culture, but it's more based off of relationships and how to treat people that you work with so that they stay with you. And it's very, very insightful because when people talk about running an organization or running a company, a lot of times when you put that word organization or company, it dehumanizes it. An organization is a bunch of people. A company is a bunch of people. You know, and so understanding that and knowing that you're not running an organization, you're leading a pack of people, then that kind of changes a lot of how you look at things. And so yeah. that, you know, it, it, it can be applied to business, but it can also be applied to your personal life as well. Gosh, that's so true. That's very well put. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh, wow. That's funny because um, me and my girlfriend have been watching this show called The Flash the last couple of days and it's all these people with different superpowers and we keep talking about which one would, would, would we want to have um that's a very tough one I think having a superpower can also take away the joy of like a process like if I can know what somebody's always thinking then that takes away from like negotiating because I know exactly well to get the deal done so like when would you get tired of it but I would think if I could read people's minds I think that would be great. But if I could control the intensity, you know, I, I don't know if I want to have it 100%. Maybe if I could read it like 50% or 60%, because there's some things you don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, know? that's the truth. For sure. I know you say that. And then all of a sudden you're reading people's minds. You're like, I actually did. Anyway, oh, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Cool. And last one, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? 
Oh, uh, best way you can send me an email. It's tosin at bapunited.com. It's B-A-P united.com. Or you can follow me on Instagram at bapunited or my personal Instagram, which is tosin underscore Oduwole. Sweet. We will link all that in the show notes. Tosa, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.